you were at Lake Rant, where I rant about whatever my $15 a month plus patrons want me to rant about, you can get one of these by being one of those. This one's for Roro, who says to rant about Nobuhiro Watsuki. How lucky for me that I wrote a video about Nobuhiro Watsuki that I never made because I just thought it was too much of a loose opinion piece, but uh, I'll just read it right now. So here's a script that never was. <clears throat> Warning, if you love Veroni Kenshin and you're the type of person whose perception of an artist will heavily affect your love for their work and you haven't yet heard of anything bad regarding Nobuhiro Watsuki, I am about to ruin everything for you. Run away while you can. <clears throat> In 2018, Veroni Kenshin author Nobuhiro Watsuki was raided by police for the possession of massive quantities of child pornography on DVD. For this, he was fined 200,000 yen, a little less than two grand US, and before the year was over, was allowed to go right back to penning his unnecessary Rurouni Kenshin sequel. Learning of all this put me in a strange crossroads. On the one hand, now the rest of the world would have a good reason to hate the author. But on the other hand, if I were to criticize him openly, as I'd long been meaning to do, people would think that I was just capitalizing on existing public outrage to suddenly hate someone whose work was perfectly fine and massively influential. All I can ask is that you believe me when I say that I didn't need an excuse to hate Nobuhiro Watsuki. All I had to do was read his manga. The child porn thing is also pretty bad, though. When I was 13, Rurouni Kenshin had been one of my favorite things in existence. Nothing appealed to me more than badass swordsmen and awesome violence, and while the Kenshin anime could be slow a lot of the time and the action didn't exactly pop off in the early episodes, the more action-centric it got, the more I loved it. My first DVD purchase ever was actually Volume 7 of the series, because it covered the mini-arc of Kenshin and his old rival Hajime Saito meeting and fighting for the first time in a sword duel which lasted several episodes. <coughs> <coughs> the DVD version was uncensored as compared to Daytime Cartoon Network, which had cut the smoke from Saito's cigarette along with the massive sprays of blood that I adored. Even more incredible still, though, was my discovery of what I first knew as Samurai X Trust and Betrayal, a prequel story with unbelievable action animation and some of the most badass sword kills in anime history to this day. Yes, that was basically all I cared about, and it ruled. <coughs> it should be no surprise, then, that when the manga started getting released stateside, I was eager to jump on it. But strangely, I only ended up buying the first volume and then giving up on it immediately. Something just wasn't right about it. Maybe it was that the blood sprays kind of looked like garbage, or that the paneling was so rigid and blocky, or that so much of what had been done to give a unique and lighthearted tone to the anime was, in fact, anime original. The manga felt kind of stuffy and boring. Almost like each chapter, Watsuki had an idea for what was going to happen, and then just dryly depicted it as straightforwardly as possible. Now, because I'm an aging millennial, my anime upbringing involved a lot of anime forums and fan-built web pages made on the now-obliterated GeoCities, and so I would constantly look around for any information I could find about the shows which I was watching on Cartoon Network, hoping to take a glimpse into their background or get a taste of what had already happened in later episodes not yet released stateside. One of the random pieces of information I came across described how Watsuki has... Uh, had ended up dr diving into the story of the famous Kyoto arc, which makes up the bulky middle third of the manga and anime adaptations, and is considered the biggest reason for Kenshin's notoriety. As it would happen, Watsuki's editor had straight up told him that he needed him to move, needed to move to a bigger central story arc with a grandiose villain, and so he did. When I finally had access to the full manga online half a decade later, and set about trying to read it all, I would discover that this was not an uncommon occurrence in Watsuki's work. In fact, a significant number of his post-chapter notations suggested that his creative decisions were basically being guided by said editor. Now, I realize that it's common for Japanese creators to humble themselves and insist that they've done less than they really have, but I can't think of another time that an author has so repeatedly admitted to simply following the guidance of their editor, and this fact feeling so plainly evident in their work. Watsuki's art and storytelling were so bland and lifeless that I could hardly imagine many of the good ideas propelling his story forward were uniquely his. I doubt, for instance, that Ao Shi would have become such a major character had he not likely ranked highly in Shonen Jump popularity polls, which were also what propelled Sasuke from Naruto to such prominence in spite of the creator being bored with him. Shonen Jump is pretty infamous for the way its editors get hands-on with the stories of their authors and how the machine of the magazine is all in service of pushing constant week-to-week -week popularity and sales to the maximum, or else canning a series the second it falls to the wayside in those regards. Rurouni Kenshin has a lot of reasons to be loved in spite of these shortcomings, though. 
If you haven't seen my video, The Most Interesting Thing About Rurouni Kenshin, I briefly detail there what the core intellectual and emotional appeal of the story is. But other factors include the fact that it's a shonen manga set in a pretty realistic depiction of the Meiji era, which is not only a fascinating time in Japanese history, but also allows for a sort of fanfiction-esque where-are-they-now continuation of the life stories of famous figures from the Bakumatsu period. It also features excellent character designs, cool sword fights, and generally does a good job of making most of the heroes and villains stand for some, some specific ideal which emblazes them into your understanding of said ideal. If you want the perfectly squared representation of a survival of the fittest mentality from an awesome looking villain, Shishio is perfect. Not because of the depth or complexity of his character, but because he is so well formulated to embody his ideal to the furthest extent that he possibly could. Moreover, the anime adaptations of Kenshin added a lot to the story. Adding the little kids and their caretaker Kaoru's uh, dojo, uh, ooh, and their caretaker to Kaoru's dojo, choosing such a bright and easygoing color palette, and generally adding or subtracting minor story elements to improve the pacing, all gave the anime series more livelihood and a greater range of emotions it seemed capable to tap into more effectively. While the anime did infamously take a nosedive when Studio Dean took over with a totally original arc that no one liked instead of the gripping backstory arc which forms the manga's last third, they made up for it in spades by doing the arc even better in the aforementioned Suiyokuhen OVA, which strips away the manga's framing device and gives us Kenshin's history as a self-contained one, flawlessly directed and beautifully rendered in such a way as to lend the weight of a true Chanbara cinematic classic to the legendary shonen story. This OVA stands at the heights of what can anime can accomplish in this genre and would easily have been worth the entire existence of Rurouni Kenshin on its own. Even the live-action films which came about in the early 2010s, while a goofy and insane comp compression of the manga story, are far more exciting than the source material. Between all of these adaptations is this weird sense of love which Watsuki himself never even seemed to harbor for the story on the same level. It feels like everyone who resonated with the core ideas and iconography of the series was able to do an even better job of bringing them to life than Watsuki had done in the first place. But if you want an argument that Nobuhiro Watsuki is a hack, you just have to look at his other work. His next run and jump, Gunblaze West, was canned in less than a year. His next major series, Buso Renkin, is a thoroughly generic, super-powered action series whose only good point is how cute this girl is and the anime's badass opening theme. Speaking as a former 13-year-old boy, I think the massiveness and intricacy of the main character's spear would have been the main reason it appealed to its target demographic. From 2007 to 2015, he and his wife co-wrote Embalming, another story of Frankenstein, which I've never heard anyone even mention before in spite of it running 10 volumes. And in the wake of that, he finally resorted to what every other washed-up popular author from the 90s has done and returned to the well of their still-relevant nostalgia property for a pointless sequel. Now, in spite of all my complaints and moaning, I don't mean for this video to be taken as a full-bore takedown of Nobuhiro Watsuki or even really a very deep reading of his work, most of which I admittedly haven't consumed at all. I don't even want you to come away from this video thinking that he sucks. Form your own opinions by reading his manga yourself, and let me know what you think of him in the comments. I'm just here to vent about the dis disappointment I've been harboring for this author ever since first trying to go back and read more of the original story and check out any of his other work. There's a lot of reasons to dislike Nobuhiro Watsuki as both an artist and a person, and I feel all of them. There you go.